Hello and welcome to Focus, a Bailiwick Express podcast. I'm Kit Hanna. This week we've been in London hearing a presentation of the findings of an expert academic review into Nazi atrocities which occurred during the occupation of Alderney. Over the next moments you'll be hearing from the academics who penned the report and have attempted to draw a line under conspiracy theories which have plagued the Alderney community for decades by delivering a conclusive number of people who perished in the island during that period. You'll also hear why no prosecutions for the perpetrators came forward, which have for the first time been revealed. And there's also insight from political leadership from the island too. But first, some context. And then you'll hear from a colleague and I the headline findings from the Lord Pickles Expert Review, presented at the Imperial War Museum this week. In 1940, Nazi Germany invaded the Channel Islands, meeting little resistance as the islands were demilitarised just weeks before they landed. They came to be the only pieces of British soil captured by German forces during the war. Each island was occupied, but Alderney, the most northerly isle, was abandoned by its inhabitants who fled to the UK in search of safety. When the Nazis arrived into it, a series of camps were constructed, some of which later became concentration camps, as Hitler ordered the creation of a vast series of fortifications stretching from Norway to the Spanish border, now known as the Atlantic Wall. Thousands of forced labourers, prisoners of war and Jews were sent to the Alderney over the course of the Second World War, and most of those in Alderney came from Soviet countries. The islands became some of the most heavily fortified places in the world. As you'll hear shortly, there are many reasons why a final figure of deaths was hard to establish in Alderney. But first, hear me and my colleague Orlando Crowcroft dissecting some of the key findings from the recent expert review. We sat on the upper floors of the Imperial War Museum in London, having just come out the presentation on the Alderney Expert Review. I'm joined with my colleague Orlando Crowcroft. Uh, we're going to just discuss some of the key findings and some of our thoughts that have arisen immediately after this um, presentation. So first of all, Orlando, what do you think the main takeaways are from the review, the presentation, and kind of what are the big stories that have really kind of come out of all this? I mean, certainly the, um, the immediate thing seems to be the death toll. I mean, that's the big, the numbers were very much part of the, part of the press conference. People were really querying the numbers. Uh, and that is, of course, that we originally thought the deaths was 389 around, well, exactly, and, uh, or around 400, and now they think it could be as much as, I think the biggest figure was 1,134, sorry, so 1,134, but they actually think it was between, it's between 641 and 1,027, uh, which is obviously a lot more, um, a lot more people. I suppose the key takeaway is that it wasn't, the death toll wasn't as high as some of the claims in recent years have been, like as high as 70,000, 40,000, you see a lot of these headlines. Um, and they're basically saying that that's not the case. Um, the other key takeaway, I guess, is the side of the the kind of the cover-up side of it, and that's that the UK government basically, back then in the 40s, um, handed this file over to the Soviets, knew that the Soviets weren't going to do anything with it, and then kind of covered up that fact. So as a result, arguably, this whole thing has rattled on for all these years. Um, and it's all, it's all come, come to the fore in more recent times, I guess. A team of nearly a dozen academics spent around a year comparing research and seeking out new sources around the world. Here's Dr Jilly Carr, the project coordinator, discussing how they went about it and their confidence in the figures. She's then followed by Lord Eric Pickles, the UK Special Envoy for Post-Holocaust Issues, who offers an apology for decades-long failings in bringing the truth to light. We've been a group of 12 academics working together, along with Lord Pickles' advisor, Professor Anthony Glees. We were initially tasked with finding out the number of labourers or prisoners who came to Alderney, as well as the total number of those who died in the island. Professor Glees' role was to find out why war crimes trials of the perpetrators in Alderney did not take place. Our starting point was our previous research. Between the 13 of us, we have several hundred years of experience and knowledge in archival interpretation and analyses I've calculated. Over the years, we've each amassed huge collections of archival files on our computers and on our shelves. Our baseline was also Caroline Sturdy Coles and Kevin Coles' recent book, Adolf Island. Our 
aim has been to find out more for the sake of those who died and those who survived the occupation of Alderney, as well as those who live in Alderney today who have had to live with continued speculation into the island's past. So we've headed to new archives. We've sent out researchers across Europe or we've travelled ourselves to find new data. We've also returned to old archives because as Anthony astutely observed to me in an early email, old archives are like olive presses and sometimes yield more oil at a second squeezing. <laughs> and so it has proved. Now, before I hand over to Lord Pickles, I will just add a spoiler. We cracked it, we exceeded our expectations, and we answered the questions set to us. And we are confident in the accuracy of our answers. It was important to tell the truth, and the truth can never harm us. And I've been distressed since my involvement in, uh, in Alderney that we've continually seen misleading information given about Alderney to the, to the distress of relatives of those who perished and, to be frank, to the distress of the people of Alderney who would occasionally and periodically wake up to the most ridiculous of claims. Could I make a couple of things clear? This is a review. It's a review by experts. It is not a judicial inquiry. It is not a quasi-judicial inquiry. And I think if you look very carefully, there's nothing quasi about any of this. And the idea that somehow we would adjudicate between a distinguished bunch of experts and um, a collection of amateur historians who frankly rely on the recycling of inaccurate newspaper cuttings and looking for a magic file that somehow will turn the, uh, the impossible into the credible. The reason we decided to approach from the question of numbers is that the Nazis were meticulous keepers of records. They made various attempts to destroy their records, but <coughs> duplicates always existed. One thing that's been extraordinarily interesting from this, in plain sight, those records uh, have been found in the most unlikely place. I'm pleased to say we do now know the names of every single British uh, person who was in Alderney throughout the whole of the occupation. We don't only know their names, we know what happened to them. I'm also pleased to know, thanks to some excellent work, we're now in a position to be, uh, be able to identify most of uh, uh, the French in particular, to be able to identify the French Jews. We're also able to identify the Spaniards. Where we have trouble uh, is some of, uh, of the old Soviets, particularly Ukrainians and, and Belarus largely because of the, of the different ways of spelling people's names and the like. But we are absolutely confident about these numbers. Totally confident about these numbers. And one more thing that I want to say, which is, uh, which is uh, two more things. The first one is, I have always regarded the description of Alderney as a mini Auschwitz as deeply insulting to the memory of those who died. Anybody who suggests that this was a mini Auschwitz does not understand what Auschwitz is, cannot have visited, and does not understand the sheer weight, the sheer vileness of the Nazi killing machine. There was clearly not an extermination camp on the island. It is extremely unlikely that the Nazis would choose to build an extermination camp on a remote island that was difficult to get to. The Nazis, and I'm sorry to put this so bluntly, were about killing lots of people. The final thing that I want to say is that the fact that the perpetrators 
of this violence and you will see courtesy of, uh, uh, of Antony, uh, a list of the kind of things that have happened, um, of um, arbitrary executions, brutality, sadism uh, that um, occurred there. It is a matter of beyond regret. It is a stain on the reputation of the United Kingdom that the perpetrators did not receive justice on British soil by, by a British judicial system. I apologise for someone who's been involved with, with, with the Holocaust. And, it, and I'm sorry that many of the perpetrators died peacefully in their beds. The question of numbers was key to the review and his project lead Dr Paul Sanders explaining how they reached their conclusion. So we determined that there was a maximum of 1,134 deaths with a probable range between 641 and 1,027. These numbers were subject to intense debate or to debate within the group. Um, and that's where obviously the inquiry, the fact that there were these two 12 scholars getting together to discuss these things where I would say the added value lay in it because um, this kind of effort is unlikely to be repeated again. Then there is a minimum of, a minimum, I stress that word, of 98 people who died in transit or who are presumed dead, so whose whereabouts were never established after the war. And then, of course, the um, review also looked into the numbers of people who passed through the island of Alderney during the war. And here we have a figure of um, circa 7,608 to 7,812. Now you will ask, where do these differences come from? They are linked to the type of evidence that we have to deal with. It is true that there is a lot of documentary and archival evidence, but that is not the be all and end all. There's also oral testimony. There are areas which are not covered by archival evidence. We all know that, otherwise Steven Spielberg wouldn't have his Shoah Foundation with his tens of thousands of interviews. Uh, these interviews add extra value, but they are also a source like any other source that needs to be dealt with, with source criticism. We cannot uncritically deal with sources. That goes for archival sources. It also goes for um, oral testimony. So, each source has its um, duties, but also its problems, let's say. They need to be interpreted, and that's the work that we did. And then we're at the end of the um, uh, report, we have um, two, uh, three sections, two dealing with uh, what's called, of course, alternative theory, so the idea that bodies may have been uh, cremated, or that there are still um, uh, mass graves to be found, and there we have two contributions that actually refute these ideas. So one from Robert Jan van Pelt, who's very well known, and the other one from Chris Green, who is also a world-leading authority in this area. Professor Anthony Glees was brought into the review at a late stage after the panel decided the lack of prosecutions for the perpetrators was a key issue that should be addressed. What he discovered, now publicly revealed for the first time, is key to understanding why conclusions have taken so long to be drawn on the Alderney case. Here's what he found. The United Kingdom did not intend the perpetrators to escape justice. Indeed, they intended that they should face justice, and indeed harsh justice, but at the hands of the Soviet Union, not at the hands of the United Kingdom. For the British war crimes investigators, led by Captain Theodore Panchev, always known as Bunny Panchev, who went on to have a distinguished career in the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. He was the lead war crimes investigator. Uh, he compiled a extensive dossier um, presenting prima facie evidence about the atrocities in Albany. And uh, what transpired is that what was called the Alderney case was passed to the Soviet Union on the 11th of September, 1945. What's boring about this is that it relates to our international treaty obligations. Again, actually some political discussion at the moment. 
The United Kingdom, along with the United States, was a signatory to the Moscow Declaration, together with the Soviet Union, the 1st of November 1943. And what that declaration was used as was the basis for all subsequent war crimes trials. That was the legal basis on which all Nazi war criminals were to be tried. And that declaration underlined the importance of territoriality. So what that declaration said was that where Nazi war criminals come into the hands of the victors of Nazi Germany, the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and subsequently France, those war criminals are to be returned to the places where their atrocities were committed to be tried by the people they have outraged. So it was a principle of territoriality. You return people to where their atrocities. There was a distinction made between major war criminals and lesser war criminals. The major war criminals were people to whom the principle of territoriality did not extend. These were Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, all these people, uh, because their crimes had no territorial basis. But then there were lesser war criminals. Lesser, not because what they'd done was necessarily less, but because they were confined to a particular territory. When Bunny Panchev carried out his report, the issue was that the vast majority of the victims of the atrocities were Soviet citizens. And that put the British government into a position. When I talk about the government, this is a government with a small g. The people in the Foreign Office, people in the Judge Advocate General's Office, and people in the Treasury Solicitor's Office. What were they to do about these people? And it was decided unilaterally by the United Kingdom, without the Soviet Union asking this in any way, that a principle of nationality should be attached to the Moscow Declaration. So not simply about territoriality, but also nationality. And when nationality was involved, and we're dealing with lesser war criminals here, so not the people who would be tried at Nuremberg, then there was no doubt that the majority of the victims of the Nazi atrocities in Alderney were Soviet citizens, and therefore the Soviet Union should have the case happened to them. And this was done, and it was done formally, with the understanding that Soviet justice would be meted out to these people. It never was. But the intention of the British government was not that these people should escape. And the British had a particular reason for wanting to have the principle of nationality rather than just the principle of territoriality. And that was because the British authorities wanted to get their hands on the Germans who had shot um, 50 of the so-called great escape prisoners who had escaped from Stalag Luft III, were arrested by the German authorities and then shot as a direct result of an order, the so-called Kugelbefehl, uh, worked out by Hitler in the Führerhauptquartier in the beginning of 1945. And this was considered an, a total outrage, as it indeed was. And the RAF, you go to their website, you will see the murder of the great escapees was the largest single atrocity carried out against British servicemen by Germans during the whole of the Second World War. The perpetrators were, however, in Soviet hands. So, the deal was done, and here you see the, the document showing it, written by Scott Fox, that if the United Kingdom give the people, uh, uh, the, the Soviets will be after to the Soviet Union, then the Soviet Union will give the people we're after to us, and indeed that happened. So I, I, I've counted four cover-ups that I think need to be uh, Look at the first cover up comes from the confusion that is obvious from the documents in the British uh, National Archives about whether all 
the victims of Nazi atrocities in Alderney were Russians, or most were Russians. And in the documents, they can, can you know, they changed the story all the time. Over time, it became all the victims were Russians. But actually, that wasn't true, as we've heard. Uh, people of up to 30 different nationalities were amongst the victims, hundreds of Jews, for example. <coughs> but the British decided that it would, for all practical purposes, as they said, all the victims should be classed as Russian. That meant it could be given to Russia and their documents. You don't actually need to see them, but documents showing that um, the, 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 uh, the Soviet Union was handed the dossier, Panchev's dossier, um, or one copy of it, I should say, was handed it and that the Soviet Union received it in October 1945. Did nothing with it. But the first cover-up was to elide the number of victims and ignore, in a sense, all those who weren't Soviet citizens. But it was not done because Britain thought that they would escape justice. Far from it. They thought the Soviets would deal with the greatest harshness towards the perpetrators. Now, the second cover-up was the decision to hand the case to the Soviet Union. Um, and this was not revealed until 1971 in papers written by Panchev himself in Alderney. And that's significant too, because Lord Pickles has talked about some of the wilder theories, and one of the wilder theories was that Pan Panchev went to work for MI6, he must be a crook, you can't believe him, and uh, his report was intended to kick the whole issue into the long grass. It's completely untrue, and Panchev always believed these people should, or the chief perpetrators should be hacked. So the uh, third cover-up was that the Soviet Union did nothing in, in, in this matter. And none of the perpetrators were, were punished. And that was covered up. And that has not been publicly revealed until today. And uh, we should not assume that the British authorities were uh, happy about this. Attlee was unhappy. The Foreign Secretary Bevin was unhappy. And above all, Sir Hartley Shawcross, the Attorney General, was so cross about it, he said, if the Russians won't try these people, we must try them ourselves. But the response from the Foreign Office was, no, we can't do that. It's an order. No British military tribunal may try a German for atrocities committed by um, uh, committed against Russians, those people must be handed over to the Soviet Union. So uh, nothing happened, and the public were never told that nothing happened. The final cover-up, cover-up number four, we know that in 1947, the French government approached, government with a small g, approached the British government with a small g, and said, look, there are a couple of people come into our hands, uh, they were responsible for the atrocities in Alderney. We want to try these people. Please give us the files that you have. And the British authorities wrote back and said, we have no files. Everything was handed over to the Russians. In effect, if you have any questions, direct them to the Soviet Union. That, too, was a complete lie. Because not only did we have these documents, but on the day after Panchev's report, a copy of it was handed to the United Nations War Crimes Commission and then to the Soviet Union, and we know the Soviet Union received it. His report was officially classified as a British government document. So we always had it. It, 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 it was always there, but we did not want the French to do that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I would say is, um, this is a very dismal story, and it is a dismal story of failure. It is a dismal story of justice denied by the post-war Labour government. But it was not their intention. And as so often, not always, but in cases like these, uh, the cover-up is actually worse than the original policy. The policy did make sense, but covering up has not made sense. And if ever there were an argument for open, transparent government, this is it. Look at the 70 years of Poland, 70 years until we've discovered the truth under Lord Pickles' uh, chairmanship. Um, that, that should not have been that case, and, and I certainly think some kind of
public apology, but some kind of recognition that none of this should have happened and would not have happened if the full truth had been told as a kind of The report has been welcomed by the Alderney community and its political leadership. I spoke with William Tate, President of the States of Alderney, just after the presentation finished. I think firstly it's a huge vote of thanks to Lord Pickles and the team because they have answered a question that has been the subject of so much discussion and debate over the years and a question which has been difficult for us as a community because we have always wanted to establish the correct figure but of course the, ver the variation in the numbers was so extreme that it needed this piece of work so that we can now say this is the best evidence available. So that's really important for us as a community. Uh, in terms of my takeaway from today, um, it's a mixture of relief and sadness. It's relief that we're not talking about tens of thousands um, because that is painful. But by the same token, it's a tremendous sadness that we now know there are people who died in Alderney that we didn't know about. So now we can add them to our story and we will, we will look at a way of being able to memorialise those additional names so that their relatives and descendants will have somewhere to come where they can pay their respects and just reflect and so I am really really happy that we are now in a place where we have a document that we can hold up to the naysayers and say, this is the document which has delivered the answer to the question. It is evidence-based and we can rely as much as you can ever rely on its findings. So, so that will be really important to us moving forward. Great. And the Alderley community were afforded the chance to watch the presentation and um, hear kind of detailed insights from the academics who did the research um, from the comfort of their own homes and the Island Hall today. How do you think it's gone down in Alderney? I think that's a brilliant initiative. Um, I mean, we, we know that most people these days have access to the internet, but we found during COVID that we have a, a proportion of our perhaps more elderly residents who don't have access to the internet. So what I wanted to do is to give them an, op uh, an opportunity to share in this event. So that's why we set up the event in the Island Hall. Uh, the feedback I have is extremely positive, that people wanted to be engaged, because let nobody let lo be under any illusion. We have always cared about what happened on our island. And any information which gives us a better understanding of that can only serve to reinforce our commitment to make sure that the message that we send out to the world never changes. It was a tragic loss of life. It was humanity at its worst. We want to show humanity at its best, and that's what we'll continue to do. And you briefly touched on this in your earlier response, but what are the sort of specific things that the States of Alderney is looking to do to sort of solidify this review and um, ensure that remembrance can continue for the victims and the atrocities that occurred in the island? Yeah, I mean, it's always important that we can learn and that we can improve and we can use technology, and that's going to be the focus of our approach. So we've already put up more boards. We're having... I think we will end up with the other three camps in the conservation area, which gives them a, a level of protection. But I'd also like to think that we can work on something which will include the names that we've just discovered. Um, and I think that's something we'll work with Lord Pickles and with Dr Carr. And um, we, we will do something which is fitting, but something which is very Alderney, because we do have a unique way in which we approach this. So, so we will continue to improve the quality of the information and so that people can understand not just what happened here but what happened to our community when they were evacuated and spent five years in the UK. That's part of the narrative. So again, just to reiterate, this is a really, really historic day for Alderney and I think we can now move forward, we can work with interested partners and parties and uh, it, it is something which will be really important moving forward.
And then, of course, there's the question of um, sort of remembering and honouring the victims, especially in light of what you said about justice being not only just delayed initially, but never actually coming. There's a great quote from Lord Pickles, which said many of them died peacefully in their beds rather than having been executed or incarcerated. Um, we know that the states of Alderney are looking into applying conservation status to some of the sites that aren't captured already by um, these sort of legal protections. Plaques and information boards are some of the key things they want to do. How important do you reckon that will be for the ordinary community and anyone who's interested as an amateur historian or a professional researcher to sort of have that, that repository and that ongoing sort of being able to add information as and when it becomes available? Yeah, I, I guess. I'm not sure how... I mean, the, the plaque, the physical plaques... Of course, there's already one, right? And I think they're thinking of putting in more. Um, Jilly Carr was talking a lot about being an online repository of information. I mean, I guess that would be useful for education purposes. Um, Professor Anthony Glees at the end said that education was the biggest takeaway. He said that make sure that, to make sure that we, you know, keep this um, this process going of educating young people about what happened there uh, and on the other, on the other Channel Islands too. Um, so I guess that would be that would be very important. I mean, we've talked before about the logistics of perhaps, you know, like for instance, um, William Tate, who was there, um, was talking about uh, folding these three camps into a conservation area. I mean, that seems quite difficult logistically, given the size of the island. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. Um, it'll definitely be interesting to see what what comes of this in the in the next few years. I mean, we were talking also, uh, Kit and I you and I, about um, the memory on the islands generally, like we both grew up, you and Guernsey, me and Jersey, we both grew up surrounded by kind of uh, remnants of Nazi occupation, bunkers and walls and, you know, it's, it was very much part of our lives um, and so it's a it really interesting question um, about how that will resonate with young people on the islands as that war rescinds into history, people get further and further away and yet those monuments are still there. Um, that's an interesting idea. Yes, one of the um, factors in this conservation question is that one of the sites on Alderney is now a housing estate. Another one is a campsite, one of the only campsites uh, in the island. The other two, more practicable, and there's already rumblings in Alderney that they're, they're going to find it difficult to apply this status to each of those sites for understandable reasons. Um, just on that, yeah, personal memories of the occupation, I've stayed in that campsite myself. Um, you know, it's quite unremarkable, it's a field, but there is this barbed wire fence that runs down the side, and I'm not suggesting in any way that that's, um, uh, you know, still remaining from the camp, but because of your proximity to it and being taught the occupation in Channel Island schools, there was this sense that while we were drinking beer there during Alderney Week, which is their biggest sort of island festival, um, watching the sun go down, playing music uh, outside of our tents, there was this kind of presence in our minds that, someone may well have been worked to death on the area that we're standing or subjected to very inhumane criminal treatment. Um, is yeah. there similar examples you can think of in Jersey? Yeah, there are lots of examples. Um, actually, the, the example that springs to mind for me was when I was in Annecy in France, uh, which is like a beautiful lakeside holiday destination. It's, like, it's stunning. It's where everyone goes, in the kind of foothills of the Alps. I was there with my family, and I remember walking down the promenade there by the lake. It's all like kind of fairgrounds and rides, and everyone's. And there's a plaque on the wall, on one of the walls, that, that just says that it's a former school, and it says, you know, on the, on the, I can't remember the date, but on the some 43, you know, the, the following children were taken away to Auschwitz, and none of them, none of them came back. It's like the name seven, eight, eleven. And I'll tell you what, that was incredibly powerful for me. Like I've, I've never forgotten that. Um, and it's something that France actually does quite well. I don't know if I'm digressing a bit here, but also in Lyon, uh, where we used to live, they, um, there are plaques there just on, on kind of on street corners, just saying, you know, on, on such and such night, the resident of this house was taken to, you know, a concentration camp and never came back. I really f I found that quite, those, that kind of example quite powerful. And so I wonder, like, Alderney doesn't have to make a huge, you know, they don't have to make huge monuments actually sometimes just a little acknowledgement is enough right um, so yeah that's that's perhaps one one way forward I suppose on the question of um, education applying that to the channel lines as well Alderney, Guernsey, Jersey um, we were all taught the occupation history and we can only hope and assume that what's been uncovered today or this week and throughout the review process will just become that extra part of the story that's incorporated because it is important for 
young people to understand exactly what happened, particularly on Alderney. And no doubt, in future, if they visit the island, they will see these these monuments, these plaques, um, noting, remembering exactly what happened. And so, do you think that there's a an issue of kind of the liberation memories, the occupation memories, kind of being lost over time, or because obviously we're so far removed from the wartime generation, is, do you think there's a danger that its prescience is being diluted at all? Yeah, definitely. But I actually thought, again, Professor Glees, um, his comments about this were really, really strong. Right at the end, he said, he said, this is about man, man's inhumanity to man. He said, the re- we need to keep reminding people of this and educating people about it because not, not only because of what happened, you know, in my, my grandparents' lifetime, actually, even in my father-in-law's lifetime, this happened. So not only that, but like the fact that it's happened, we're doing it right now to other people in other countries. Um, I just thought that was really, really powerful. He, he said, you know, we have to, because, and he, and he also made the point that if we don't judge our own history, then how can we criticize and, and try to fix problems in other places where they're happening? How can we be, yeah, how can we, how can we be trusted to pass judgment on things that are happening in other countries that we want to call out as being wrong or prosecute for war crimes if we don't address our own war crimes? And I think that was what he was saying at the end, which was really, mm. I just thought was really powerful and, and a real reminder that actually, I remember when I was at school thinking, oh, we don't learn about anything except the Second World War and, uh, and the occupation. And, re- and thinking, oh, we, can we not learn about something else? But actually, uh, as I've got older and the more I've read about it, uh, I've kind of feel now that we don't learn enough about it. You know, like we, we should be looking at it even more than we did. Uh, when we were at school, which is, you know, hopefully um, going to continue the, the kind of research that we saw today and the historians that did this, this report, um, the kind of work that they do uh, remains as important as it always has been. Another thing that was raised was um, a strong denial that there was a death factory and extermination camp on the island, with the researchers going as far to say that there was no mini Auschwitz, quote, uh, on Alderney. Um, that's obviously a significant claim to make and really underscores their attempt to try and draw a line under conspiracy theories and hold up a central document. Um, how powerful do you think that is and yeah. the scale of what it suggests? I thought it was really powerful. And I also, I mean, going back through some of the headlines that have been come out in the last few years from our tabloid newspapers in the UK, I mean, they are, they are pretty scandalous. I mean, when you think about it, Eric Pickles was very, very outspoken about it. Um, very strong, I thought, talking about how it, it not only undermined what happened in Alderney, but undermined what happened in Auschwitz. Um, and he talked a lot about the numbers. You know, it was incredibly like powerful to me that he said, you know, he said, it, at their heights, the death counts were killing like 14, 15,000 people a day in Europe. And so the population of Alderney could have been done within a couple of hours. He, he was talking about how the Nazi killing machine, and this is definitely something I've read in other books, the Nazi killing machine was so efficient. It was, it was, like, it was designed to kill as many people as possible. So, so why would the Nazis do that on a small island of very few people? It, it was, you know, it's, it, it, they're very brutal arguments to make, um, to think about it like that. But I guess that was... I guess that was how they came up with it. I mean, there are other there are other really interesting parts, like when they were denying about the, they were denying, they were refuting the idea that bodies were burned in Alderney, which is one of the accusations made by some historians. Um, and they said that the reason they thought this hadn't happened was, firstly, you would notice if there was a big mass fire, mass pyre of bodies, because burning bodies makes a lot of smoke. And they said, so why wouldn't any of the residents have mentioned it, or the people who were there have mentioned it? Um, and the other argument they said was actually the process of burning people in those numbers is incredibly complicated and that the Nazis actually struggled with it in Eastern Europe. Um, like these are like incredibly powerful historical arguments, right, to, to, to talk mm. about it like that in the pure logistics of it. Um, so those, those were definitely strong takeaways for me. I asked Dr. Carr at the end of the presentation whether what they had achieved for Alderney should be replicated for the other Channel Islands. That's a very interesting question and I think people need to understand that it's a a different story in Guernsey and Jersey because so many of the local population were there witnessing what was happening and we don't see the SS coming with prisoners 
Um, the numbers who are in Guernsey and Jersey are much more known. So, for example, there are publicly accessible documents in Guernsey and Jersey which list the dead. And so we've got names, we've got numbers. In Alderney, we think there are potential mass graves in places with, with other people in. These are not alleged for Guernsey and Jersey. And I think people must uh, appreciate that it is a different story for Guernsey and Jersey. It isn't um, as extreme as Alderney was, and we know an awful lot more. And plus, let's not forget that there have been scholars such as Paul Sanders, who's been chairing this report, who have written about the subject already. So in his book, um, written 20 years ago, The German Occupation of the Channel Islands, that talked about forced labour. So I think we know an awful lot more about the forced labour in Guernsey and Jersey. And there are some museums such as... um, Jersey war tunnels which tell the story of individual labourer types such as the Spanish Republicans and I think there's been more spokespeople as well in Guernsey and Jersey to talk about this subject for example Gary Font, Gary Font son of slave worker and forced labourer Francisco Font who every year um, reawakens attention to the subject of forced labour through the slave worker ceremony at Westmount. So uh, it is a different kettle of fish and much more is known. It's not the big question mark that Alderney has been for 80 years. You've been listening to Focus, a Bailiwick Express podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider sharing and subscribing so we at Express can continue to pull apart the issues that matter to you, the listener. Thank you for joining us.